The word that sums up the new nature we have in Christ is the word love. Love is in the context of relationship. And Jesus said, a new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second great commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Jesus is saying, now I'm going to give you a new commandment. I'm going to put it right up there with love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. It gets harder. I mean, you know, you get, love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, it's just getting tough. Now Jesus says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus said on one occasion, all of the law and the, and the commandments uh, and the prophets hang on these two things. That is, love God, love your neighbor. It's all about love. All of the commandments, everything in the Old Testament, everything in the prophets, is all about love. Loving God, loving your neighbor, which I understand to be those outside loving God's people as Christ has loved us. Jesus, Jesus said it's all about love. Now what Jesus said is loving one another is at the heart of what would mark his disciples. In fact, he said his plan to change the world revolved around establishing a community of spirit-transformed people who would walk together in authentic love. You say, well, Jesus, don't you have any kind of backup plan in case that doesn't work? I mean, your people are not doing a real good job at this. He says, by this, people will know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. On one occasion, he said, how's the world going to know that Jesus was sent by the Father if we love one another? We, we use apologetics to try to convince people that Jesus really is who he was, who he said he was. And he's the only way to God. And, you know, so we... What the world is not looking, is not looking so much for your apologetic reasons as they are the love that would say, oh, you're a disciple of Christ. By this show men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one for another. But that's God's plan. How many of you know that if you don't have a group of people to introduce someone to, then all of the evangelistic programs that we have they're not going to produce much. Jesus said, well, here's my, my evangelistic methodology. I'm going to have a group of spirit-transformed people who live together in authentic love and community. And as you introduce people to, the, to this group of people, they're going to find themselves drawn to Christ. If you don't have that, then you've got to have a lot of different programs and gimmicks and a lot of stuff to sort of make up for that. Now, Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, very important verse, kind of sums it up this way. The only thing that counts, so the only thing that really matters, is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in great boast of God's going to do this. We're just claiming that. 
that, I thought that was what faith was. Faith, how do you know if a person has faith? It, it's exp it expresses itself in love. We live in a society that has reduced faith to a commodity, which I use to somehow benefit myself. If you just buy for th three low pay payments of twenty nine ninety five, you can get my sermon series on how to get everything you've ever wanted from God. We've reduced faith to that. To American Christians, it does not seem contradictory for someone to get up and claim to have great faith and their relationships are in a total shambles and nobody likes this person, nobody wants to be around them. But they get up and, and they, they have great faith, bless God. But their faith does not make them love others anymore. In fact, they usually don't want to have anything to do with people. They just want to get up on the platform and do their faith thing. If your faith does not cause you to love, to create a greater love for others, then Paul questions whether that's faith. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you have faith that moves mountains, then sign them up. Bless God, Here's God, this guy's got faith, he can move mountains. Cast him into the sea. He said, if you have faith to do that kind of stuff, and you, but you don't love, then you are nothing. He doesn't, he doesn't even say you have nothing. He said, you are nothing. He says, if your love, if your faith does not produce a greater love, there's something seriously wrong. Scriptures constantly link faith and love. Let's look at some verses. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. We thank God for you because your faith is growing more and more. How do I know? Because you, the love that each of you has for that every one of you has for each other is increasing. I know your, your faith is growing because your love is increasing. First Timothy chapter one, verse five, and this was one of the verses God gave me when we first started this church 20 years ago as a grid, which I, I use every time I prepare a message. I ask myself, the goal of my instruction is, is my instruction producing love from a pure heart a good conscience, and a sincere faith. As long as I can do that, then I don't, I don't feel the need to have to preach all the latest and greatest kind of stuff that people want to hear. My goal is, does it, is it producing love from a pure heart? Is it producing a clear conscience, which is what the grace of God is all about? An evil conscience is one that condemns us because we don't understand the grace of God and what is accomplished for us, and a sincere faith. 1 John 4.20, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. Or put it another way, how can you say you love God whom you have never seen? And yet you don't, and not love your brother whom, whom, who's right in front of you. Well, that's exactly why I can love God, because I don't see him. Because he's not, the, he's, he's, I love him in the abstract. It's like, oh, God, I love God, bless God, I love God, I love God, because he's not standing right in front of me. We, how many of you know you can love people in the abstract? We love mankind, it's just people we hate. We love the church. It's just the people in the church that we that bug the heck out of us. I, just, I don't want to have anything to do with the people, but I love the church. So the first point is you cannot divorce faith in God 
at least not and be true to Scripture, from fellowship with God's people and from loving God's people. All right. You're, you're still not sure whether to, to amen or oh my on that one. Let's go to number two. Certain spiritual dynamics can only happen in the context of community. God has designed us that way, and God has designed the community of God that way. There are certain spiritual dynamics that can only happen when we're in community with other people. There's kind of a spiritual synergy that takes place. Synergy is when working together produces a greater total effect than the sum of our individual efforts. So we all do our own thing on separately and come together. The sum of that, uh, compared to when we're, when we're in community together, then it creates an exponential effect, um, which is far beyond the sum total of our individual efforts. Let me give you an example. I think that Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 is uh, an expression of the spiritual synergy that Jesus is talking about. He says, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Now, what does he mean by that? I mean, Jesus is with us all the time, right? He said he'd never leave us or forsake us. I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean Jesus saying, I'd really rather be at the megachurch down the street, but you know, you, as long as you've got a few people, I'll come show up at your church meeting. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is, he's, he doesn't say, even if you just have two or three. See, we use that verse to apologize. On a snow day when only 20 people show up, say, so, well, the Bible says, if even two or three of you show up, Jesus will show up, so he must be here. He doesn't say, if only two or three. He says, we're two or three. And I think his point is, I will, where you gather together in community, even if it's two or three, you gather together in community, I will be in your midst. I will reveal myself and move in a way that you cannot experience God alone only. Now, there are, it's important for us to have our own relationship with God and be able to read the Word of God and, and experience His presence. But it's important for us to know that there are certain spiritual dynamics that only take place in community. Many, many of you have experienced this, I'm sure. Times when you felt the, the presence of God move in powerful ways. And you felt swept along in worship and you could have worshipped all day. And, and there was a sense of the presence of God. I find that is more likely to take place in community with, other, with God's people than at my dining room table where I have my devotions. Um, I, I experience God, but usually I don't get carried away in worship and lost in the presence of God once in a while, but not like it would happen in community. I think that God designed it that way. I think that there are times when the, the teaching of God's word not only brings insight to our understanding, but brings healing to our heart and breaks bondages that we've struggled with for years as we come together with the people of God. And the word is taught and spirit anointed. And, and can we read the word on our own? Of course we can read the word on our own. Uh, I encourage that. There's a sense in which when we're together as, as the community of God, the word of God seems amplified. There are times when God gave you hope, support, direction, guidance, comfort through the community of God. Not always, not necessarily from up here, but the people who are part of that community. There are two important things that need to take place for spiritual growth. One is I need to be right, rightly related to the head who is Christ. Rightly related to God. But number two, I need to be rightly related to the community of God. 